From the Conference Center at Temple Square in Salt Lake City, this is the Sunday afternoon session of the 188th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the concluding session of the 188th Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at the conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to members of the church and friends everywhere who are participating in these proceedings by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy with Andrew Unsworth and Brian Mathias at the organ. The choir will open this meeting by singing in hymns of praise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Gary B. Sabin of the 70.
our dear Father in heaven. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here assembled for this concluding session of this general conference. We are so thankful, Father, for the inspiring music and messages that we have heard and felt during this revelatory and historic conference weekend. We pray that our hearts will be open and our minds open to the messages that have been so thoughtfully and prayerfully prepared that we might act upon the impressions we feel to become closer to Thee and better disciples of Thy beloved Son. We are mindful, Father, of many assembled here and throughout the world who are carrying heavy burdens, who feel alone or afraid or confused. We pray that the hope and the comfort and the clarity of the gospel will provide the help that they seek and the answers they seek. We are deeply grateful, Father, for thy love, for thy beloved Son, for the plan and for the opportunity to be here, to be led by living prophets, seers, and revelators. We pray that we might minister one to another as our dear prophet has taught us so well that we might help each other along the covenant path back home to Thee. And we do so in the most worthy and sacred name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The choir will now favor us with I Believe in Christ. We will then be pleased to hear from President Henry B. Eyring, who serves as second counselor in the First Presidency. He will be followed by Brother Brian K. Ashton, who serves as second counselor in the Sunday School General Presidency. Elder Robert C. Gay of the Presidency of the Seventy will then address us, and he will be followed by Elder Matthew L. Carpenter of the Seventy.
My dear brothers and sisters, I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. This conference has been uplifting and edifying for me. The music sung and the words spoken have been carried by our, to our hearts by the Holy Ghost. I pray that what I say will be conveyed to you by that same Spirit. Many years ago, I was first counselor to a district president in the eastern United States. More than once, as we were driving to our little branches of the church, he said to me, Hal, when we meet someone, treat them as if they were in serious trouble, and you will be right more than half the time. <laughs> Not only was he right, but I have learned over the years that he was too low in his estimate. Today, I wish to encourage you in the troubles you face. Our mortal life is designed by a loving God to be a test and source of growth for each of us. You remember God's words regarding His children at the creation of the world. And we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. Since the beginning, the tests have not been easy. We face trials that come from having mortal bodies. All of us live in a world where Satan's war against truth and against our personal happiness is becoming more intense. The world and your life can seem to you to be in increasing commotion. My reassurance is this, simply. The loving God, who allowed these tests for you, also designed a sure way to pass through them. Heavenly Father so loved the world that He sent His beloved Son to help us. His Son, Jesus Christ, gave His life for us. Jesus Christ bore in Gethsemane and on the cross the weight of all our sins. He experienced all the sorrows, the pains, the effects of our sins so that He could comfort us and strengthen us through every test in life. You remember the Lord said to His servants, quote, The Father and I are one. I am in the Father, and the Father in me. And inasmuch as ye have received me, ye are in me, and I in you. Wherefore, I am in your midst. I am the Good Shepherd and the Stone of Israel. He that buildeth upon this rock shall never fall. Our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, has also given that same assurance. Moreover, he described a way we might build upon that rock and put the Lord's name upon our hearts to guide us through our trials. He said, open quote, You may be momentarily disheartened. Remember, life is not meant to be easy. Trials must be borne and grief endured along the way. As you remember that with God nothing shall be impossible, know that He is your Father. You are the son or daughter created in His image, entitled through your worthiness to receive revelation to help with your righteous endeavors. You may take upon you the holy name of the Lord you can qualify to speak in the sacred name of God." Close quote. President Nelson's words remind us of the promise found in the sacramental prayer, a promise our Heavenly Father fulfills 
as we do what we in turn promise to do. Listen to the words. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son. And witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of Thy Son, and always remember Him, and keep His commandments which He has given them, that they may always have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. Each time we say the word Amen, when that prayer is offered on our behalf, we pledge that by partaking of the bread, we are willing to take upon us the holy name of Jesus Christ. Always remember Him and keep His commandments. In turn, we are promised that we may always have His Spirit to be with us. Because of these promises, the Savior is the rock upon which we can stand safely and without fear in every storm we face. As I have pondered the covenant words and corresponding blessings promised, I have wondered what it means to be willing to take upon us the name of Jesus Christ. President Dallin H. Oaks explains, open quote, it is significant that when we partake of the sacrament, we do not witness that we take upon us the name of Jesus Christ, the witness that we are, we witness that we are willing to do so. The fact that we only witness to our willingness suggests that something else must happen before we actually take that sacred name upon us in the most important sense." Close quote. The statement that we are willing to take upon us His name tells us that while we first take the Savior's name when we were baptized, taking His name is not finished at baptism. We must work continually to take His name throughout our lives, including when we renew covenants at the sacrament table and make covenants in the Lord's holy temples. So two qu crucial questions for each of us become, quote, what must I be doing to take His name upon me? And how will I know when I am making progress? The statement of President Nelson suggests one helpful answer. He said that we could take the name of the Savior upon us and that we could speak for Him. When we speak for Him, we serve Him. Remember the quotation, for how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served and who is the stranger unto him and is far from the thoughts and intents of his heart. Speaking for him requires a prayer of faith. It takes fervent prayer to Heavenly Father to learn what words we could speak to help the Savior in his work. We must qualify for the promise whether by mine own voice or by the, by the voice of my servants, it is the same. Yet it takes more than speaking for him to take his name upon us. There are feelings in our hearts we must have to qualify as his servants. The prophet Mormon described the feelings that qualify us and enable us to take his name upon us. These feelings include faith, hope, and charity, which is the pure love of Christ. Mormon explained to people just like you, for I judge that ye have faith in Christ because of your meekness. For ye, if ye have not faith in him, then ye are not fit to be numbered among the people of his church. And again, my beloved brethren and sisters, I would speak unto you concerning hope. How is it that ye can attain unto faith, save ye shall have hope? 
And what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you that ye shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal. And this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope. For without faith, there cannot be any hope. And again, behold, I say unto you that he cannot have faith and hope, save he shall be meek and lowly of heart. If so, his faith and hope is vain, for none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly in heart. And if a man be meek and lowly in heart and confesses by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ, he must needs have charity. For he have not charity, he is nothing. Wherefore, he must needs have charity. After ch describing charity, Mormon goes on to say, but charity is the pure love of Christ and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with him. Wherefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, I pray unto the Father and with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with his love, which he hath bestowed upon all those who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified, even as he is pure. Amen. My testimony is that the Savior is putting his name in your hearts. For many of you, your faith in him is increasing. You are feeling more hope and optimism, and you are feeling the pure love of Christ for others and for yourself. I see it in our missionaries serving all over the world. I see it in members who are speaking to their friends and family members about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Men, women, young people, and even children are ministering out of love for the Savior and for their neighbors. At the first report of disasters across the world, which are now so frequent, members make plans to go to the rescue, sometimes across oceans without being asked. They sometimes find it hard to wait until the devastated areas can receive them. I realize that some of you listening today may feel that your faith and hope are being overcome by your troubles, and you may yearn to feel love. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has opportunities near you to feel and to share his love. You can pray with confidence for the Lord to lead you to someone for him. He answers the prayers of meek volunteers like you. You will feel the love of God for you and for the person you serve for him. As you help children of God in their troubles, your own troubles will seem lighter. Your faith and your hope will be strengthened. I am eyewitness of that truth. Over a lifetime, my wife has spoken for the Lord and served people for him in many places. As I've mentioned before, one of our bishops once said to me, Brother Iring, I'm amazed. Every time I hear of a person in the ward who is in trouble, I hurry to help. Yet by the time I arrive, it seems that your wife has already been there. That has been true in all the places we have lived for 56 years. Now she can speak only a few words a day. She is visited by people she loved for the Lord every night and morning. I sing hymns with her and we pray. I have to be voice in the prayers and in the songs. Sometimes I can see her mouthing the words of the hymns. She prefers children's songs. The sentiment she seems to like best is summarized in the song, I'm trying to be like Jesus. The other day, after singing the words of the chorus, love one another as Jesus loves you, try to show kindness in all that you do, she said softly, but clearly, try, try, try. I think she will find when she sees him that our Savior has put his name into her heart and that she has become like him. He is carrying her through 
her troubles now as he will carry you through yours. I bear you my witness that the Savior knows and loves you. He knows your name as you know his. He knows your troubles. He has experienced them. By his atonement, he has overcome the world. By your being willing to take his name upon you, you will lift the burden of countless others, and you will find in time that you know the Savior better and that you love him more. His name will be in your heart and fixed in your memory. It is the name by which you will be called. I so witness with gratitude for his loving kindness to me, to my loved ones, and to you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. For her entire life, my wife Melinda has tried with all her heart to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Yet beginning in her youth, she felt unworthy of Heavenly Father's love and blessings because she misunderstood his, his nature. Fortunately, Melinda continued to keep the commandments in spite of the sadness she felt. A few years ago, she had a series of experiences that helped her better God, understand God's nature, including his love for his children and his gratitude for our, our even imperfect efforts to do his work. She explains how this has influenced her. Quote, I now feel sure that the Father's, the Father's plan works, that he is personally invested in our success, and that he provides us with the lessons and experiences we need to return to his presence. I see myself and others more as God sees us. I am able to parent, teach, and serve with more love and less fear. I feel peace and confidence rather than anxiety and insecurity. Instead of feeling judged, I feel supported. My faith is more certain. I feel my Father's love more often and more deeply." End quote. Having a correct idea of Heavenly Father's character, perfections, and attributes is essential to exercising faith sufficient to obtain exaltation. A correct understanding of Heavenly Father's character can change how we see ourselves and others and help us to understand God's tremendous love for his children and his great desire to help us become like him. An incorrect view of his nature can leave us feeling as if we are incapable of ever making it back to his presence. My objective today is to teach key doctrinal points about the Father that will allow each of us, but especially those who wonder if God loves them, to better understand his true character and to exercise greater faith in him, his son, and his plan for us. In the pre-mortal world, we were born as spirits to heavenly parents and lived, and lived with them as a family. They knew us, taught us, and loved us. We wanted very much to be like our heavenly father. However, to do so, we recognized that we would have to, one, obtain glorified, immortal, physical bodies. Two, be married and form families by the sealing power of the priesthood. And three, acquire all knowledge, power, and divine attributes. Consequently, the Father created a plan that would allow us upon certain conditions to obtain physical bodies that would become immortal and glorified in the resurrection, marry and form families in mortality, or for the faithful who did not have this opportunity after mortality, progress towards perfection, and ultimately return to our heavenly parents and live with them and our families in a state of exaltation and eternal happiness. The scriptures call this the plan of salvation. We were so grateful for this plan that when it was presented to us, we shouted for joy. Each of us accepted the conditions of the plan including the experiences and challenges of mortality that would help us develop divine attributes. During mortality, Heavenly Father provides us with the conditions we need to progress within his plan. The Father begot Jesus Christ in the flesh and provided him with divine help to fulfill his mortal mission. Heavenly Father will likewise help each of us if we will strive to keep his commandments. The Father gives us agency 
Our lives are in his hands and our days are known and shall not be numbered less. And he ensures that eventually all things work for the good of those who love him. It is Heavenly Father who gives us our daily bread, which includes both the food we eat and the strength we need to keep his commandments. The Father gives good gifts. He hears and answers our prayers. Heavenly Father delivers us from evil when we let him. He weeps for us when we suffer. Ultimately, all of our blessings come from the Father. Heavenly Father guides us and gives us the experiences we need based on our strengths, weaknesses, and choices so that we might bear good fruit. The Father chastens us when necessary because he loves us. He is a man of counsel who will counsel with us if we ask. It is Heavenly Father who sends both the influence and the gift of the Holy Ghost into our lives. Through the gift of the Holy Ghost, the glory or intelligence, light, and power of the Father can dwell in us. If we will strive to increase in light and truth until our eyes become single to God's glory, Heavenly Father will send the Holy Spirit of promise to seal us up unto eternal life and reveal his face unto us either in this life or the next. In the post-mortal wor spirit world, Heavenly Father continues to shed forth the Holy Ghost and send missionaries to those who need the gospel. He answers prayers and helps those who lack them receive vicarious saving ordinances. The Father raised up Jesus Christ and gave him power to bring to pass the resurrection, which is the means by which we obtain immortal bodies. The Savior's redemption and resurrection bring us back into the presence of the Father, where we will be judged by Jesus Christ. Those who rely upon the merits and mercy and grace of the Holy Messiah will receive glorified bodies like the Father and dwell with him in a state of never-ending happiness. There, the Father will wipe away all our tears and help us continue on our journey become, to become like him. As you can see, Heavenly Father is always there for us. To become like the Father, we must develop his character traits. Heavenly Father's perfections and attributes include the following. The Father is endless and eternal. He is perfectly just, he's just, merciful, kind, long-suffering, and wants only what is best for us. Heavenly Father is love. He keeps his covenants. He does not change. He cannot lie. The Father is no respecter of persons. He knows all things, past, present, and future, from the beginning. Heavenly Father is more intelligent than us all. The Father has all power and does all that he takes in his heart to do. Brothers and sisters, we can trust in and rely upon the Father. He has an eternal perspective. Because he has an eternal perspective, Heavenly Father can see things we cannot. His joy, work, and glory are to bring to pass our immortality and exaltation. Everything he does is for our benefit. He wants our eternal happiness even more than we do, and he would not require us to experience a moment more of difficulty than is absolutely needed for our benefit or for that of those we love. As a result, he focuses on helping us to progress, not on judging and condemning us. As spirit sons and daughters of God, each of us has the potential to become like the Father. To do so, we must worship the Father in the name of the Son. We do this by striving to be obedient to the will of the Father as the Savior was, and by continually repenting. As we do these things, we receive grace for grace until we receive of the Father's fullness and are endowed with his character, perfections, and attributes. Given the distance between what we are as mortals and what Heavenly Father has become, it is not surprising that some feel that becoming like the Father is unattainable. Nevertheless, the scriptures are clear. If we will cleave in faith to Christ, repent and seek God's grace through obedience, eventually we will become like the Father. I take great comfort in the fact that those who strive to be obedient will receive grace for grace and ultimately receive of his fullness. In other words, we won't become like the Father on our own. Rather, it will come through gifts of grace, some big, but mostly small, that build upon one another until we have a fullness 
But brothers and sisters, it will come. I invite you to trust that Heavenly Father knows how to exalt you, seek his daily sustaining help, and press forward with faith in Christ even when you cannot feel God's love. There is much we do not understand about becoming like the Father, but I can testify with certainty that striving to become like the Father is worth every sacrifice. The sacrifices we make here in mortality, no matter how great, are simply incomparable to the immeasurable joy, happiness, and love we will feel in God's presence. If you are struggling to believe it is worth the sacrifices you are asked to make, the Savior calls to you saying, ye have not as yet understood how great blessings the Father hath prepared for you. You cannot bear all things now. Nevertheless, be of good cheer, for I will lead you along. I testify that your Heavenly Father loves you and wants you to live with him again. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. My fellow brothers and sisters, recently, as I was pondering President Nelson's charge to call the church by its revealed name, I turned to where the Savior instructed the Nephites about the name of the church. As I read the Savior's words, I was struck by how he also told the people that ye must take upon you the name of Christ. This caused me to look at myself and ask, am I taking upon myself the Savior's name as he would have me do so? Today, I would like to share some of the impressions I have received in answer to my question. First, to take upon ourselves the name of Christ means we faithfully strive to see as God sees. How does God see? Joseph Smith said, well, one portion of the human race is judging and condemning the other without mercy. The great parent of the universe looks upon the whole of the human family with a fatherly care and a paternal regard, for his love is unfathomable. A few years ago, my older sister passed away. She had had a challenging life. She struggled with the gospel and was never really active. Her husband abandoned their marriage and left her with four young children to raise. On the evening of her passing, in her room with her children present, I gave her a blessing to peacefully return home. At that moment, I realized I had too often defined my sister's life in terms of her trials and inactivity. As I placed my hands on her head that evening, I received a severe rebuke from the Spirit. I was made acutely aware of her goodness and allowed to see her as God saw her, not as someone who struggled with the gospel in life, but as someone who had to deal with difficult issues I did not have. I saw her as a magnificent mother who, despite great obstacles, had raised four beautiful, amazing children. I saw her as a friend to our mother who took time to watch over and be a companion to her after our father passed away. During that final evening with my sister, I believe God was asking me, can't you see that everyone around you is a sacred being? Brigham Young taught, I wish to urge upon the saints to understand men and women as they are and not understand them as you are. How often it is said such a person has done wrong and he cannot be a saint. We hear some swear and lie or break the Sabbath. Do not judge such persons, for you do not know the design of the Lord concerning them. Rather, bear with them. Can any one of you imagine our Savior letting you and your burdens go unnoticed by him? The Savior looked upon the Samaritan, the adulterer, the tax collector, the leper, the mentally ill, and the sinner with the same eyes. All were children of his Father. All were redeemable. Can you imagine him turning away from someone with doubts about their place in God's kingdom or from anyone afflicted in any manner? I cannot. In the eyes of Christ, each soul is of infinite worth. No one is preordained to fail. Eternal life is possible for all. From the Spirit's rebuke at my sister's bedside, I learned a great lesson, that as we see as he sees, ours will be a double victory, redemption of those we touch and redemption of ourselves. 
Second, to take upon ourselves the name of Christ. We must not only see as God sees, but we must do his work and serve as he served. We live the two great commandments. Submit to God's will, gather Israel, and let our light shine before men. We receive and live the covenants and ordinances of his restored church. As we do this, God endows us with power to bless ourselves, our families, and the lives of others. Ask yourself, do I know anyone who does not need the powers of heaven in their lives? God will work wonders among us as we sanctify ourselves. We sanctify ourselves by purifying our hearts. We purify our hearts as we hear him, repent of our sins, become converted, and love as he loves. The Savior asked us, for if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? I recently learned about an experience in the life of Elder James E. Talmage that caused me to pause and consider how I love and serve those around me. As a young professor, before he ever became an apostle in the height of the deadly diphtheria epidemic of 1892, Elder Talmage discovered a family of strangers, not members of the church, who lived near him that were stricken by the disease. No one wanted to put themselves at risk by going inside the affected home. Elder Talmage, however, immediately proceeded to the home. He found four children, a two and a half year old dead on the floor, a five year old and 10 year old in great pain and a weakened 13 year old. The parents were suffering with grief and fatigue. Elder Talmage dressed the dead and the living, swept the rooms, carried out the soiled clothing and burned filthy rags covered with the disease. He worked all day and then returned the next morning the 10-year-old died during the night. He lifted and held the five-year-old. She coughed bloody mucus all over his face and clothes. He wrote, I could not put her from me, and he held her until she died in his arms. He helped bury all three children and arrange for food and clean clothing for the grieving family. Upon returning home, Brother Talmage disposed of his clothes, bathed in a zinc solution, quarantined himself from his family, and suffered through a mild attack of the disease. So many lives around us are at stake. Saints take the Savior's name upon themselves by becoming holy and ministering to all, regardless of where or how they stand. Lives are saved as we do so. Finally, I believe that to take upon ourselves his name, we must trust him. At a meeting I attended one Sunday, a young woman asked something like the following. My boyfriend and I recently broke up and he chose to leave the church. He tells me he has never been happier. How can this be? The Savior answered this question when he said to the Nephites, but if your life is not built upon my gospel and is built upon the works of men or upon the works of the devil, verily I say unto you, you will have joy in your works for a season and by and by, the end cometh. There simply is no enduring joy outside the gospel of Jesus Christ. At that meeting, however, I thought about the many good people I know who struggle with great burdens and commandments that are daunting at best for them. I asked myself, what else might the Savior say to them? I believe he would ask, do you trust me? To the woman with the issue of blood, he said, thy faith hath made thee whole, go in peace. One of my favorite scriptures is John 4.4, 4, which reads, and he must needs go through Samaria. Why do I love that scripture? Because Jesus did not need to go to Samaria. The Jews of his day despised the Samaritans and traveled a road around Samaria. But Jesus chose to go there to declare before all the people for the first time that he was the promised Messiah. For this message, he not only chose an outcast group, but also a woman, and not just any woman, but a woman living in sin, someone considered at that time to be the least of the least. I believe Jesus did this so that each of us may always understand that his love is greater than our fears, our wounds, our addictions, our doubts, our temptations, our sins, our broken families, our depression and anxieties, our chronic illness, our poverty, our abuse, our despair, and our loneliness. 
He wants all to know there is nothing and no one he is unable to heal and to deliver to enduring joy. His grace is sufficient. He alone descended below all things. The power of his atonement is the power to overcome any burden in our life. The message of the woman at the well is that he knows our life situations and that we can always walk with him no matter where we stand. To her and to each of us, he says, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but shall have a well of water springing up into everlasting life. In any of life's travels, why would you ever turn away from the only Savior who has all power to heal and deliver you? Whatever the price you must pay to trust him is worth it. My brothers and sisters, let us choose to increase our faith in Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ. From the very depths of my soul, I bear testimony that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the Savior's Church, directed by the living Christ through a true prophet. My prayer is that we will faithfully take upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ by seeing as he sees, by serving as he serves, and by trusting that his grace is sufficient to deliver us home and to endure in joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. A few months into his mission, our youngest son and his missionary companion were completing their study when our son felt a dull pain in his head. He felt very strange. At first, he lost control of his left arm. Then his tongue went numb. The left side of his face began to droop. He had difficulty speaking. He knew something was wrong. What he didn't know was that he was in the middle of a massive stroke in three areas of his brain. Fear began to set in as he became partially paralyzed. How quickly a stroke victim receives care can have a dramatic effect on the extent of his healing. His faithful missionary companion acted decisively. After calling 911, he gave him a blessing. Miraculously, the ambulance was only five minutes away. After our son was rushed to the hospital, the medical personnel quickly assessed the situation and determined they should administer a medicine to our son that could potentially reverse the stroke's paralyzing effects over time. However, if our son was not having a stroke, the medicine could have severe consequences, such as bleeding in the brain. Our son had to choose. He chose to accept the medication. While full recovery required more operations and many months, our son eventually returned and completed his mission after the effects of the stroke were substantially reversed. Our Heavenly Father is all-powerful and all-knowing. He knows our physical struggles. He is aware of our physical pains due to illness, disease, aging, accidents, or birth disorders. He is aware of emotional struggles associated with anxiety, loneliness, depression, or mental illness. He knows each person who has suffered injustice or who has been abused. He knows our weaknesses and the propensities and temptations we struggle with. During mortality, we are tested to see if we will choose good over evil. For those who keep His commandments, they will live with Him in a state of never-ending happiness. To help us in our progression to become like Him, Heavenly Father has given all power and knowledge to His Son, Jesus Christ. There is no physical, emotional, or spiritual ailment that Christ cannot heal. During the mortal ministry of the Savior, the scriptures recount many miraculous events where Jesus Christ used His divine power to heal those who suffered physically. The Gospel of John recounts the story of a certain man who had endured a debilitating infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man responded that no one was around to help him when he needed it most. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man who was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Please note the juxtaposition of how long this man suffered on his own, 38 years, and how quickly the healing came once the Savior became involved. The healing was immediate. 
In another instance, a woman with an issue of blood 12 years who had spent all of her living upon physicians came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she declared unto him before all the people how she was healed immediately. Through his ministry, Christ taught that he had power over the physical body. We cannot control the timing of when Christ's healing of our physical ailments will occur. Healing occurs according to his will and wisdom. In the scriptures, some suffered for decades, others their entire mortal lives. Mortal infirmities can refine us and deepen our reliance upon God. But when we allow Christ to be involved, he will always strengthen us spiritually so we can have greater capacity to endure our burdens. Ultimately, we know that every physical ailment, malady, or imperfection will be healed in the resurrection. That is a gift to all mankind through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can heal more than just our physical bodies. He can heal our spirits as well. Throughout Scripture, we learn how Christ helped those whose spirits were weak and made them whole. As we ponder these experiences, our hope and faith in the Savior's power to bless our lives increases. Jesus Christ can change our hearts, heal us from the effects of injustice or, or abuse we may experience, and strengthen our capacity to bear loss and heartache bringing us peace to help us endure the trials of our lives, healing us emotionally. Christ can also heal us when we sin. We sin when we knowingly break one of God's laws. When we sin, our soul becomes unclean. No unclean thing can dwell in God's presence. Becoming clean from sin is to be healed spiritually. God the Father knows we will sin, but he has prepared a way for us to be redeemed. Elder Lynn G. Robbins taught, Repentance isn't God's backup plan in the event we might fail. Repentance is His plan knowing that we will. When we sin, we have the opportunity to choose the good from the evil. We choose the good when we repent after we have sinned. Through Jesus Christ and His atoning sacrifice, we can be redeemed through our sins, from our sins, and brought back to the presence of God the Father if we repent. Spiritual healing is not one-sided. It requires the Savior's redemptive power and sincere repentance on the part of the sinner. For those who choose not to repent, they are rejecting the healing Christ offers. For them, it is as though no redemption was made. As I have counseled with others seeking to repent, I have marveled that people who were living in sin had difficulty making correct decisions. The Holy Ghost would leave them, and they often struggled to make choices that would bring them closer to God. They would wrestle for months or even years, embarrassed or frightened of the consequences of their sins. Often they felt that they could never change or be forgiven. I have often heard them share their fear that if their loved ones knew what they had done, they would stop loving them or leave them. When they followed this line of thinking, they resolved to just keep quiet and delay their repentance. They incorrectly felt that it was better not to repent now so that they would not further hurt those they loved. In their minds, it was better to suffer after this life than go through the repentance process now. Brothers and sisters, it is never a good idea to procrastinate your repentance. The adversary often uses fear to prevent us from acting immediately upon our faith in Jesus Christ. When loved ones are confronted with the truth about sinful behavior, while they may feel deeply wounded, they often want to help the sincerely repentant sinner to change and to reconcile with God. Indeed, spiritual healing accelerates when the sinner confesses and is surrounded by those who love them and help them to forsake their sins. Please remember that Jesus Christ is mighty in how he also heals the innocent victims of sin who turn to him. Elder Boy K. Packer stated, Our spirits are damaged when we make mistakes and commit sins. But unlike the case of our mortal bodies, when the repentance process is complete, no scars remain because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. The promise is, Behold, he who has repented of his sins 
the same is forgiven, and I, the Lord, remember them no more. When we repent with full purpose of heart, immediately shall the great plan of redemption be brought about in our lives. The Savior will heal us. The missionary companion and the medical professionals who helped our stroke-afflicted son in the mission field acted quickly. Our son chose to receive the stroke-reversing medicine. The paralyzing effects of his stroke that could have followed him for the remainder of his mortal life were reversed. Likewise, the faster we repent and bring the Atonement of Jesus Christ into our lives, the sooner we can be healed from the effects of sin. President Russell M. Nelson offered this invitation. If you have stopped, stepped off the path, I invite you to please come back. Whatever your concerns, whatever your challenges, there is a place for you in this, the Lord's Church. You and generations yet unborn will be blessed by your actions now to return to the covenant path. Our spiritual healing requires us to submit ourselves to the conditions our Savior has outlined. We must not delay. We must act today. Act now so that the spiritual paralysis does not prevent your eternal progression. While I have been speaking, if you have felt the need to ask forgiveness of someone you have wronged, I invite you to act. Tell them what you have done. Ask for their forgiveness. If you have committed a sin that impacts your temple worthiness, I invite you to counsel with your bishop today. Do not delay. My brothers and sisters, God is our loving Father in heaven. He has given all power and knowledge to His beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Because of Him, all mankind will one day be healed of every physical ailment forever. Because of the Atonement of Jesus Christ, if we choose to repent and turn our hearts fully to the Savior, He will heal us spiritually. That healing can begin immediately. The choice is ours. Will we be made whole? I testify that Jesus Christ paid the price so that we can be made whole, but we must choose to take that healing medicine He offers. Take it today. Do not delay. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing Glory to God on High. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Jack N. Gerard of the Seventy. Elder Gary E. Stevenson of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles will then address us. This is the 188th semi-annual general conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
the fictional character, Mary Poppins, is the typical English nanny who happens to be magical. She blows in on the east wind to help the troubled Banks family of number 17 Cherry Tree Lane in Edwardian London. She's given charge of the children, Jane and Michael. In a firm but kind manner, she begins to teach them valuable lessons with an enchanting touch. Jane and Michael make considerable progress, but Mary decides that it's time for her to move on. In the stage production, Mary's chimney sweep friend, Bert, tries to dissuade her from leaving. He argues, but they're good kids, Mary. Mary replies, would I be bothering with them if they weren't? But I can't help them if they won't let me. And there's no one so hard to teach as the child who knows everything. Bert asks, so? Mary answers, so they've got to do the next bit on their own. Brothers and sisters, like Jane and Michael Banks, we are good kids who are worth bothering about. Our Heavenly Father wants to help and bless us, but we don't always let him. Sometimes we even act as if we already know everything, and we too need to do the next bit on our own. That's why we came to earth from a pre-mortal heavenly home. Our bit involves making choices. Our Heavenly Father's goal in parenting is not to have his children do what's right, is to have his children choose to do what is right and ultimately become like him. If he simply wanted us to be obedient, he would use immediate rewards and punishments to influence our behaviors. But God is not interested in his children just becoming trained and obedient pets who won't chew on his slippers in the celestial living room. <laughs> no, God wants his children to grow up spiritually and join him in the family business. God established a plan whereby we can become heirs in his kingdom, a covenant path that leads us to become like him, have the kind of life he has, and live forever as families in his presence. Personal choice was and is vital to this plan, which we learned about in our premortal existence. We accepted the plan and chose to come to earth. To ensure that we would exercise faith, and learn to use our agency properly, a veil of forgetfulness was drawn over our minds so we would not remember God's plan. Without that veil, God's purposes would not be achieved because we could not progress and become the trusted inheritors he wants us to be. The prophet Lehi said, Wherefore the Lord gave unto man that he should act for himself, Wherefore, man could not act for himself, save it should be that he was enticed by the one or the other. At a fundamental level, one option is represented by Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the Father. The other option is represented by Satan, Lucifer, who wants to destroy agency and usurp power. In Jesus Christ, we have an advocate with the Father, after completing his atoning sacrifice, Jesus ascended into heaven to claim of the Father his rights of mercy, which he hath upon the children of men. And having claimed the rights of mercy, he advocateth the cause of the children of men. Christ's advocacy with the Father in our behalf is not adversarial. Jesus Christ, who allowed his will to be swallowed up in the will of the Father, would not champion anything other than what the Father has wanted all along. Heavenly Father undoubtedly cheers for and applauds our successes. Christ's advocacy is, at least in part, to remind us that he has paid for our sins and that no one is excluded from the reach of God's mercy. For those who believe in Jesus Christ, repent, and are baptized and endure to the end, a process that leads to reconciliation, 
the Savior forgives, heals, and advocates. He is our helper, consoler, and intercessor, attesting to and vouching for our reconciliation with God. In stark contrast, Lucifer is an accuser or prosecutor. John the Revelator described Lucifer's ultimate defeat. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Why? Because the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Lucifer is this accuser. He spoke against us in the premortal existence and he continues to denounce us in this life. He seeks to drag us down. He wants us to experience endless woe. He's the one who tells us we're not adequate, the one who tells us we're not good enough, the one who tells us there's no recovery from a mistake. He is the ultimate bully, the one who kicks us when we're down. If Lucifer were teaching a child to walk and the child stumbled, he'd scream at the child, punish him, and tell him to quit trying. Lucifer's ways bring discouragement and despair, eventually and always. This father of lies is the ultimate purveyor of falsehood and cunningly works to deceive and distract us, for he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself. If Christ were teaching a child to walk and the child stumbled, he'd help the child get up and encourage next steps. Christ is the helper and consoler. His ways bring joy and hope, eventually and always. God's plan includes directions for us, referred to in the scriptures as commandments. These commandments are neither a whimsical set nor an arbitrary collection of imposed rules meant only to train us to be obedient. They're linked to our developing the attributes of godliness, returning to our Heavenly Father, and receiving enduring joy. Obedience to His commandments is not blind. We knowingly choose God and His pathway home. The pattern for us is the same as it was for Adam and Eve, wherein God gave unto them commandments after having made known unto them the plan of redemption. Though God wants us to be on the covenant path, he gives us the dignity of choosing. Indeed, God desires, expects, and directs that each of his children choose for himself or herself. He will not force us. Through the gift of agency, God permits his children to act for themselves and not to be acted upon. Agency allows us to choose to get on the path or not. It allows us to get off or not. Just as we cannot be forced to obey, we cannot be forced to disobey. No one can, without our cooperation, take us off the path. Now, this is not to be confused with those whose agency is violated. They're not off the path, they're victims. They receive God's understanding, love, and compassion. But when we get off the path, God is saddened because he knows that this eventually but invariably leads to diminished happiness and forfeited blessings. In the scriptures, getting off the path is referred to as sin, and the resultant decrease in happiness and forfeited blessings is called punishment. In this sense, God is not punishing us. Punishment is a consequence of our own choices, not his. When we discover that we're off the path, we can stay off. Or because of the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can choose to reverse our steps and get back on. In the scriptures, the process of deciding to change and return to the path is referred to as repentance. Failure to repent means that we choose to disqualify ourselves from the blessings God desires to give. If we're not willing to enjoy that which we might have received, we will return to our own place 
to enjoy that which we are willing to receive. Our choice, not God's. No matter how long we've been off the path or how far away we have wandered, the moment we decide to change, God helps us return. From God's perspective, through sincere repentance and pressing forward with the steadfastness in Christ, once back on the path, it will be as if we were never off. The Savior pays for our sins and frees us from the looming decrease in happiness and blessings. This is referred to in the scriptures as forgiveness. After baptism, all members slip off the path. Some of us even dive off. Therefore, exercising faith in Jesus Christ, repenting, receiving help from Him, and being forgiven are not one-time events, but lifelong processes, processes that are repetitive and iterative. This is how we endure to the end. We need to choose whom we will serve. The magnitude of our eternal blessings depends on choosing the living God and joining Him in His work. As we strive to do the next bit on our own, we practice using our agency correctly. As two former Relief Society General Presidents said, we should not be babies that need petting and correction all the time. No, God wants us to become mature adults and govern ourselves. Choosing to follow the Father's plan is the only way we can become inheritors in His kingdom. Only then can He trust us to not even ask for that which is contrary to His will. But we need to remember that there's no one so hard to teach as the child who knows everything. So we need to be willing to be tutored in the Lord's way by the Lord and His servants. We can trust that we're beloved children of heavenly parents and worth bothering about and be assured that on our own will never mean alone. As the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob said, I say with him, therefore cheer up your hearts and remember that ye are free to act for yourselves, to choose the way of everlasting death or the way of eternal life. Wherefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that you're saved. So choose faith in Christ. Choose repentance. Choose to be baptized and receive the Holy Ghost. Choose to conscientiously prepare for and worthily partake of the sacrament. Choose to make covenants in the temple. And choose to serve the living God and His children. Our choices determine who we are and who we will become. I conclude with the rest of Jacob's blessing. Wherefore, may God raise you from everlasting death by the power of the Atonement, that ye may be received into the eternal kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Several years ago, while preparing for a business trip, I began to experience chest pain. Out of concern, my wife decided to accompany me. On the first leg of our flight, the pain intensified to the point that it was difficult for me to breathe. When we landed, we left the airport and went to the local hospital, where after multiple tests, the attending physician declared us safe to continue our travel. We returned to the airport and boarded a flight to our final destination. As we were descending, the pilot came on the intercom and asked me to identify myself. The flight attendant approached, said they had just received an emergency call, and told me there was an ambulance waiting at the airport to take me to the hospital. We boarded the ambulance and were rushed to the local emergency room. There, we were met by two anxious doctors who explained that I had been misdiagnosed 
and actually had a serious pulmonary embolism or blood clot in my lung, which required immediate medical attention. The doctors informed us that many patients do not survive this condition. Knowing we were far from home and not sure if we were prepared for such life-altering events, the doctors said that if there was anything in our lives that we needed to consider, now was the time. I remember well how almost instantaneously in that anxious moment, my entire perspective changed. What seemed so important just moments earlier was now of little interest. My mind raced away from the comfort and cares of this life to an eternal perspective. Thoughts of family, children, my wife, and ultimately an assessment of my own life. How were we doing as a family and individually? Were we living our lives consistent with the covenants we had made and the Lord's expectations? Or had we perhaps unintentionally allowed the cares of the world to distract us from those things which matter most? I would invite you to consider an important lesson learned from this experience, to step back from the world and to assess your life. Or, in the words of the doctor, if there is anything in your life you need to consider, now is the time. We live in a world of information overload dominated by ever-increasing distractions that make it more and more difficult to sort through the commotion of this life and focus on things of eternal worth. Our daily lives are bombarded with attention-grabbing headlines served up by rapidly changing technologies. Unless we take the time to reflect, we may not realize the impact of this fast-paced environment on our daily lives and the choices we make. We may find our lives consumed with bursts of information, packaged in memes, videos, and glaring headlines. Although interesting and entertaining, most of these have little to do with our eternal progress, and yet they shape the way we view our mortal experience. These worldly distractions could be likened to those in Lehi's dream. As we progress down the covenant path with our hand firmly affixed on the iron rod, we hear and see those mocking and pointing their fingers from the great and spacious building. We may not consciously intend to do so, but sometimes we pause and shift our gaze to see what all the commotion is. Some of us may even let go of the iron rod and move closer for a better view. Others may fall away entirely because of those that were scoffing at them. The Savior cautioned us to take heed lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with cares of this life. Modern revelation reminds us that many are called but few are chosen. They are not chosen because their hearts are set upon the things of this world and aspire to the honors of men. Assessing our lives gives us an opportunity to step back from the world, reflect on where we stand on the covenant path, and if necessary, make adjustments to ensure a firm grip and a forward gaze. Recently, in a worldwide youth devotional, President Russell M. Nelson invited the youth to step back from the world, disengaging from social media by holding a seven-day fast, and just last evening also invited the sisters as part of the Women's Conference. He then asked them, asked the youth, to notice any differences in how they feel, what they think, or even how they think. He then invited them to do a thorough life assessment with the Lord to ensure that your feet are firmly planted on the covenant path. He encouraged them 
that if there were things in their lives that needed changing, today is the perfect time to change. In assessing things in our lives that need to change, we might ask ourselves a practical question. How do we rise above the distractions of this world and stay fixed on the vision of eternity before us? In a 2007 conference address entitled Good, Better, Best, President Dallin H. Oaks taught how to prioritize choices among our many conflicting worldly demands. He counseled, quote, we have to forego some good things in order to choose others that are better or best because they develop faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen our families, end quote. May I suggest that the best things in this life are centered on Jesus Christ and understanding the eternal truths of who He is and who we are in our relationship with Him. As we seek to know the Savior, we should not overlook the fundamental truth of who we are and why we are here. Amulek reminds us that this life is the time to prepare to meet God the time which is given us to prepare for eternity. As the well-known axiom reminds us, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Understanding our divine origins is essential to our eternal progress and can free us from the distractions of this life. The Savior taught, if ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. President Joseph F. Smith proclaimed, quote, The greatest achievement mankind can make in this world is to familiarize themselves with divine truth so thoroughly, so perfectly, that the example or conduct of no creature living in the world can ever turn them away from the knowledge that they have obtained." End quote. In the world today, the debate over truth has reached a fevered pitch, with all sides claiming truth as if it were a relative concept open to individual interpretation. The young boy Joseph Smith found that so great were the confusion and strife in his life that it was impossible to come to any certain conclusion who was right and who was wrong. It was in the midst of this war of words and tumults of opinions that he sought divine guidance by seeking truth. In April conference, President Nelson taught, quote, if we are to have any hope of sifting through the myriad of voices and the philosophies of men that attack truth, we must learn to receive revelation, end quote. We must learn to rely on the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. As this world moves swiftly to alternative realities, we must remember the words of Jacob, that the spirit speaketh the truth and lieth not. Wherefore, it speaketh of things as they really are and of things as they really will be. Wherefore, these things are manifested unto us plainly for the salvation of our souls. As we step back from the world and assess our lives, now is the time to consider what changes we need to make. We can take great hope in knowing that our exemplar, Jesus Christ, has once again led the way. Prior to his death and resurrection, as he was laboring to help those around him understand his divine role, he reminded them that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Of him I bear witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
In a recent conversation with a friend of mine, he told me that when he was a young, newly baptized member of the church, he suddenly felt like somehow he did not fit in anymore in his ward. The missionaries who had taught him had been transferred away, and he felt like he was on the periphery. Without friends in the ward, he found his old friends, and with them engaged in activities that took him away from participating at church, so much so that he began to stray from the flock. With tears in his eyes, he described how deeply grateful he was when a fellow ward member extended a ministering hand to him and invited him to return in a warm and inclusive way. Within months, he was back in the safety of the flock, strengthening others as well as himself. Aren't we grateful for the shepherd in Brazil who sought after this young man, Elder Carlos A. Godoy, who now sits behind me as a member of the Presidency of the Seventy? Isn't it remarkable how such small efforts can have eternal consequences? This truth is at the heart of the Church's ministering efforts. Heavenly Father can take our simple daily efforts and turn them into something miraculous. It's only been six months since President Russell M. Nelson announced that the Lord has made important adjustments in the way we care for each other, explaining we will implement a newer, holier approach to caring for and ministering to others. We will refer to these efforts simply as ministering. President Nelson also explained, a hallmark of the Lord's true and living Church will always be an organized, directed effort to minister to individual children of God and families. Because it is His, it is his Church, we as His servants will minister to the One just as He did. We will minister in His name with His power and authority and with His loving kindness. Well, since that announcement, your response has been incredible. We've received reports of great success in implementing these changes in nearly every stake in the world as directed by our living prophet. For example, ministering brothers and sisters have been assigned to families. Companionships, including young men and young women, have been organized and ministering interviews are taking place. I don't think it's a coincidence that Six months prior to the revelatory announcement of yesterday, a new balance between gospel instruction in the home and in the church, the revelatory announcement on ministering was given. Beginning January, as we spend one less hour in our church worship, all that we have learned in ministering will help us rebalance that void in a higher and holier home-centered Sabbath day experience with family and loved ones. With these organizational structures in place, we might ask, how do we know we are ministering in the Lord's way? Are we assisting the Good Shepherd in the way He intends? In a recent discussion with President Henry B. Eyring, he commended the Saints in adjusting to these notable changes, but also expressed his, his sincere hope that members recognize that ministering is more than just being nice. That is not to say that being nice is inconsequential, but those who understand the true spirit of ministering realize that it goes far beyond merely being nice. Done in the Lord's way, ministering can have a far-reaching influence for good that ripples throughout all eternity as it has for Elder Godoy. The Savior showed by example what it means to minister as He served out of love. He taught, prayed for, comforted, and blessed those around Him, inviting all to follow Him. As Church members minister in a higher and holier way, they prayerfully seek to serve as He would, to watch over the Church always and be with and strengthen them, to visit the house of each member and help each become a true disciple of Christ. Continuing the thread introduced by Sister Corden this morning, a true shepherd loves his sheep, knows each one by name, and has personal interest in them. My friend of many years spent his life as a rancher, doing the hard work of raising cattle and sheep in the rugged Rocky Mountains. 
He once shared with me the challenges and hazards associated with raising sheep. He described that in early spring, when snow on the expansive mountain range had mostly melted, he placed the family herd of approximately 2,000 sheep in the mountains for the summer. There, he watched over the sheep until late fall, when they were moved from the summer range to a winter range in the desert. He described how tending a large flock of sheep was difficult, requiring early days and late nights, waking well before sunrise and finishing long after dark. He could not possibly do it alone. Others helped tend the flock, including a mix of experienced ranch hands, assisted by younger hands who were benefiting from the wisdom of their companions. He also relied on two old horses, two colts in training, two old sheepdogs, and two or three sheepdog pups. Over the course of the summer, my friend and his sheep faced wind and rainstorms, sickness, injuries, drought and just about every other hardship one can imagine. Some years they had to haul water all summer just to keep the sheep alive. Then every year in late fall when winter weather threatened and the sheep were taken off the mountain and counted, there were usually more than 200 that were lost. The flock of 2,000 sheep placed in the mountains in early spring was reduced to less than 1,800. Most of the missing sheep were not lost to sickness or natural death, but to predators such as mountain lions or coyotes. These predators usually found the lambs that had strayed from the safety of the flock, withdrawn themselves from the protection of their shepherd. Would you consider for a moment what I have just described in a spiritual context? Who is the shepherd? Who is the flock? Who are those who assist the shepherd? The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The prophet Nephi likewise taught that Jesus shall feed his sheep, and in him they shall find pasture. I find abiding peace in knowing that the Lord is my shepherd and that each of us is known by him and under his care. When we confront life's wind and rainstorms, sickness, injuries, and drought, the Lord, our shepherd, will minister to us. He will restore our souls. In the same way that my friend tended his sheep with the assistance of young and old ranch hands, horses, and sheepdogs, the Lord also requires assistance in the challenging labor of caring for the sheep in his flock. As children of a loving Heavenly Father and as sheep in His flock, we enjoy the blessings of being individually ministered to by Jesus Christ. Simultaneously, we have a responsibility to provide ministry and assistance to others around us as shepherds ourselves. We heed the words of the Lord to serve me and go forth in my name and gather together my sheep. Who is the shepherd? Every man, woman, and child in the kingdom of God is a shepherd. No calling is required. From the moment we emerge from the waters of baptism, we are commissioned to this work. We reach out in love to others because it is what our Savior commanded us to do. Alma emphasized, For what shepherd, having many sheep, doth not watch over them, that the wolves may not enter and devour his flock? Doth not he drive him out. Whenever our neighbors are in distress, temporally or spiritually, we run to their aid. We bear one another's burdens that they may be light. We mourn with those who mourn. We comfort those that stand in need of comfort. The Lord lovingly expects this of us, and the day will come when we will be held accountable for the care we take in ministering to His flock. My shepherd friend shared another important element in the watch care of sheep on the range. He described that lost sheep were particularly vulnerable to the dangers of predators. In fact, up to 15% of his and his team's total time was devoted to finding lost sheep. The sooner they found lost sheep before the sheep drifted too far from the flock, 
the less likely the sheep were to be harmed. Recovering lost sheep required much patience and discipline. Some years ago, I found an article in a local newspaper so intriguing that I saved it. The front page headline read, Determined Dog Won't Abandon Lost Sheep. This article describes a small number of sheep belonging to an operation not far from my friend's property that were somehow left behind in their summer range. Two or three months later, they became stranded and snowbound in the mountains. When the sheep were left behind, the sheepdog stayed with them, for it was his duty to look after and protect the sheep. He would not go off watch. There he remained, circling about the lost sheep for months in the cold and snowy weather, serving as a protection against coyotes, mountain lions, or any other predator that would harm the sheep. He stayed there until he was able to lead or herd the sheep back to the safety of the shepherd and the flock. The image captured on the front page of this article allows one to see character in the eyes and demeanor of this sheepdog. In the New Testament, we find a parable and instruction from the Savior that provides further insight pertaining to our responsibility as shepherds, ministering sisters and brothers of lost sheep. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. As we summarize the lesson taught in the parable, we find this valuable counsel. First, we are to identify the lost sheep. Second, we search after them until they are found. Third, when they are found, we may have to lay them on our shoulders to bring them home. Finally, we surround them with friends upon their return. Brothers and sisters, our greatest challenges and our greatest rewards may come as we minister to lost sheep. The members of the Church in the Book of Mormon watched over their people and did nourish them with things pertaining to righteousness. We can follow their examples and remember that ministering is to be led by the Spirit, flexible and customized to the needs of each member. It is also critical that we seek to help individuals and families prepare for their next ordinance keep their covenants, and become self-reliant. Every soul is precious to our Heavenly Father. His personal invitation to minister is of greatest value and importance to Him, for it is His work and glory. It is quite literally the work of eternity. Each one of His children has immeasurable potential in His sight. He loves you with a love you cannot even begin to comprehend. Like the devoted sheepdog, the Lord will stay on the mountain to protect you through the wind, rainstorms, snow, and more. President Russell M. Nelson taught us last conference, our message to the world, and may I add to our ministering flock, is simple and sincere. We invite all of God's children on both sides of the veil to come under their Savior receive the blessings of the Holy Temple, have enduring joy, and qualify for eternal life. May we raise our sights to this prophetic vision so we can shepherd souls to the Temple and ultimately to our Savior Jesus Christ. He does not expect us to perform miracles. He only asks that we bring our brothers and sisters unto Him, for He has the power to redeem souls. As we do so, we can and will secure this promise and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Of this I testify, and of Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
At the conclusion of the conference, we express sincere appreciation to all who have worked so diligently to prepare for these services. We thank those who have spoken and those who have provided the uplifting music. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close the meeting by singing our prayer to thee, and the benediction will then be offered by Michael John U. Tay of the 70, and the conference will be adjourned for six months. Well, this has been a, an inspirational and historic conference. We look to the future with enthusiasm. We have been motivated to do better and to be better. The marvelous messages delivered from this pulpit by our general authorities and general officers and the music have been sublime. I urge you to study these messages commencing this week. They express the mind and the will of the Lord for His people today. The new home-centered, church-supported, integrated curriculum has the potential to unleash the power of families as each family follows through conscientiously and carefully to transform their home into a sanctuary of faith. I promise that as you diligently work to remodel your home into a center of gospel learning, over time, your Sabbath days will truly be a delight. Your children will be excited to learn and to live the Savior's teachings. And the influence of the adversary in your life and in your home will decrease. Changes in your family will be dramatic and sustaining. During this conference, we have strengthened our resolve to execute the essential effort to honor the Lord Jesus Christ every time we refer to His Church. I promise you that our rigorous attention to use the correct name of the Savior's Church and its members will lead to increased faith and access to greater spiritual power for members of His Church. Now, Let's turn to the topic of temples. We know that our time in the temple is crucial to our salvation and exaltation and to that of our families. After we receive our own temple ordinances and make sacred covenants with God, each one of us needs the ongoing spiritual strengthening and tutoring that is only possible in the house of the Lord and our ancestors need us to serve as proxy for them. Consider the great mercy and fairness of God, who before the foundation of the world provided a way to give temple blessings to those who died without a knowledge of the gospel. These sacred temple rites are ancient. To me, that antiquity is thrilling and another evidence of their authenticity. My dear brothers and sisters, the assaults of the adversary are increasing exponentially in, in intensity and in variety. Our need to be in the temple on a regular basis has never been greater. I plead with you to take a prayerful look at how you spend your time. Invest time in your future and in, and in that of your family. If you have reasonable access to a temple, I urge you to find a way to make an appointment regularly with the Lord to be in His holy house, and then keep that appointment with exactness and joy. I promise you that the Lord will bring the miracles He knows you need as you make sacrifices to serve and worship in His temples. Currently, we have 159 dedicated temples. The proper care and maintenance of those temples is very important to us. With the passage of time, temples are inevitably in need of refreshing and renewal. 
To that end, plans are now being made to renovate and update the Salt Lake Temple and other Pioneer Generation temples. Details on these projects will be shared as they are developed. Today, we are pleased to announce plans to construct 12 more temples. Those temples will be built in the following locations. Mendoza, Argentina. Salvador, Brazil. Yuba City, California. Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Praia, Cape Verde. Jigo, Guam. Puebla, Mexico. Auckland, New Zealand. Lagos, Nigeria. Davao, Philippines. San Juan, Puerto Rico. Washington County, Utah. Building and maintaining temples may not change your life, but spending your time in the temple surely will. To those who have long been absent from the temple, I encourage you to prepare and return as soon as possible. Then I invite you to worship in the temple and pray to feel deeply the Savior's infinite love for you that each of you may gain your own testimony that he directs this sacred and ageless work. Brothers and sisters, I thank you for your faith and sustaining efforts. I leave my love and blessing upon you that you may feast upon the word of the Lord and apply his teachings in your personal lives. I assure you that revelation continues in the church and will continue until the purposes of God shall be accomplished and the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done. I bless you with increased faith in him and in his holy work, with faith and patience to endure your personal challenges in life. I bless you to become exemplary Latter-day Saints I so bless you and bear my testimony that God lives. Jesus is the Christ. This is his church. We are his people. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Our loving Father in heaven, we come before thee now in gratitude at the conclusion of yet another historic and revelatory General Conference weekend. We thank thee, Father, for a living prophet on the earth today, even President Russell M. Nelson, and the 14 other men whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. We pray for a blessing upon them. Bless them with health and safety as they circle the globe to declare thy word. We are truly grateful for the revelation, counsel, and guidance that we have received from thee through them at this time. May we now be able to take these things, take it back to our lives, and to our homes, to our friends, and maybe we, we be wise that we'll truly seek confirmation from thee and further revelation, personal revelation, on how these things can bless us and bless thy children. We are truly grateful for the new temples that have been announced that will be a blessing to thy faithful children who are scattered around the globe. Thank thee, Father. Thank thee for thy generosity and kindness and for always reaching out to all thy children throughout the world. This time we pray that for safety as we depart from the conference center, but that our minds and our hearts will continue to look forward and have a vision of what we can be, that our conversion will truly deepen and our faith in Heavenly Father and thy Son in thee and thy Son Jesus Christ will be strengthened. We again remember thine servant, President M. Russell Ballard, our brother, our fellow servant, and our leader. Bless him and comfort him and his family in this tender time as Sister Ballard has been called upon to continue her work beyond the veil. Father, we love thee, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 188th Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from the general authorities and general officers of the church. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.